the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. These last few weeks in the adult Christian formation series, Alan and Leslie Kathman have been leading us in a consideration of faith and science, a consideration of faith and science, where we've been asking the question, are they compatible or are they mutually exclusive? We've been examining the concepts of time, where it began, when it began, what are the boundaries of time. We've been considering space, the origins of space. Where does it begin? Where does it end? We've been considering the origins of life. We've been considering genetics. We've been considering, or soon we'll consider, climate. How does it change? Where does it begin? And with each concept, we ask the question, can one believe in God and accept scientific proofs? Or can we accept scientific proofs and still believe in God? And we wonder, why is this question so compelling? Well, I know that it is. Because a few weeks ago, we put paper up all around the parish hall, and we asked adults, come and tell us what you might be interested in considering in adult formation. And we had topics like the books of the Bible, the Gospel of Luke. We had spiritual practices, how to pray, how to do good discernment. We had topics like how does one live an ethical Christian life in postmodern America? We had topics like bad girls of the Bible. I thought, sure, we'd have lots of ticks on that page, but no. No, it was all about faith and science. Why is this so? At the beginning, at the beginning of their consideration, the Catholics pointed out what has been proven by social scientists over and over again is that human beings have a natural default to tribalism. Human beings have a natural default to tribalism. We want to gather people around us like us. We want to be unified with our people. We are in search for our people that understand the world the way we understand the world. People who have our same sort of core beliefs that value what we value. And at the center of tribalism is this question. Who are we and who is in charge? Are we God-fearing people or are we godless heathen? At the core of our essence, who are we and who has power over us and who is it that we hold most dear in our hearts? Who do we believe is a creator and has movement in the world and has power over our lives. Someone who studied this tribal essence of human beings was Margaret Mead. And two interesting facts about Margaret Mead are this. She was a trained social scientist with an MA and PhD from Columbia University. She was held in high regard and esteem across academic circles for her work in anthropology. And she was also an Episcopalian who played a significant role in the drafting of our 1979 prayer book. Some of the prayers that we pray, the way our worship unfolds, are under the, by the direct influence of Margaret Mead. But what we may remember best about her is her study of the Samoan people and her insights into American and Western culture. 
in the forward of her classic text, there is this thought. Courtesy, modesty, good manners, conformity to definite ethical standards are universal. But what constitutes courtesy, modesty, very good manners, and definitive ethical standards is not universal. It is instructive to know that standards differ in the most unexpected ways. Conformity to definite ethical standards, good manners, modesty, courtesy are universal, but what we understand as good manners and definite ethical standards differ across our tribes. Some tribes believe that monogamy, one man, one woman, married together, raising family, that's the standard. Some tribes believe that's no way to run a society, that it's much better for a man to have many wives to divide up the labor. Some tribes believe and have believed that it's good to have free range movement, that you follow the seasons and you follow the game. And some tribes believe, no, it's better to settle down and stake out boundaries and have land rights. Within even a homogeneous culture, tribal tensions sometimes arise and good people and good citizens and faithful people to God and responsible people have very, very different views on an issue. And over time, sometimes, sometimes these different views can threaten the civility of a culture and one side has to be persuaded to join the other because the stress becomes intolerable and too painful. And how is this movement from one deeply held belief to another accomplished? How are these people persuaded, these good, faithful people persuaded? Margaret Mead offers a second insight. Never doubt, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. In our own society, in our own society, we have three examples where tribal stress and the persuasion to move to the other side was led by a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens. There was a time, there was a time in our country, there was a time in our community, there was a time when the members of our church, the members that gave us land, the members that gave money for us to build the bricks of this congregation owned slaves. They loved their wives, they raised their children, they believed in their God, and they owned slaves. And there was a time in our country when there were people who were not dependent on slaves for economic stability and thought, this is not right, this is not of God. And no one wanted to enter into this economic moral morass. No one wanted to deal with it. And Henry Beecher and Harriet Tubman and Absalom Jones, people with no platform and no backing and no reason in the world to believe that anyone would listen to them stood up and said, this is not of God, and we have to deal with this. And slowly and slowly they made their voices heard, and the tribal view 
was persuaded. Not easily and not without conflict, but they stood up and their voice was heard. There was a time in our country, there was a time in our community, there was a time when people sitting in those pews, sitting right where you're sitting, there were women who regardless that God had given them intellect and stamina and skill were not allowed to institutions of higher learning, were not allowed to go into a profession of their choice that they were skilled and gifted to do. There was a time they could not take out a loan. There was a time they could not sign a contract. There was a time they couldn't even vote for people who might be able to change those kind of laws and regulations. They could not determine their own destiny. And then there was Lucretia Mont, Sojourner Truth, Sarah Grimke, no power, no reason to believe they were exceptional, no forum stood up and said, this is not of God. And this needs to change. And no reason to believe anyone would listen to them. People of good faith and good intent stood up and said, this is not of God, this needs to change. There was a time, there was a time in this country, in this community, there was a time when young people sitting in these pews would not, would not have been going on mission trips. There would not have been a youth Sunday celebrating high school graduation. There was a time in this community where children seven years old were going to work, were going to work in factories 12 to 18 hours a day, six days a week for a dollar a day. There was a time in this community when 75% of spinners in our textile in industry were under 14 years of age. And Lewis Hines and Samuel Gumpers and Jane Adams stood up and said, this is not of God. And this is not of a just society. Who were these people? Had no power, had no influence, had no forum. Responsible, committed people, thoughtful people that stood up and said, this is not of God. And the tribal view changed. It's not just in our society only. I mean, it's all through our scriptural corpus. Twelve nobodies, a couple of fishermen, itinerant tent maker, stood up and said to the Roman Empire, the greatest power on the face of the globe, put down your multiple gods, honor the one God, put down your oppressive power, love all neighbors, No forum, no army behind them. Thoughtful, reflective people stood up and said, this way is not of God, and it's not the way to a just society. It wasn't in the New Testament only. Tracy just read about Samuel. Samuel gets sent to Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a no, a no-nothing kind of place. Nothing exciting is going on in Bethlehem. Nobody important's come out of Bethlehem. There's Jesse and his seven sons. The first strong son gets pulled in front of Samuel. No, I don't think that's the one. The second strongest, very smart son. No, I don't think that's the one. Down the line, down the line, down the line. Are there any more? Well, there's David. There's David. Where's David? Oh, he's out taking care of the sheep. We'll bring him forward. Little David. The youngest of an inconsequential family in an unconsequential town gets pulled up and begins a dynasty, a united kingdom. No 
never forget what a small group of thoughtful, committed people can do. They change the world, and indeed, they are the only ones who do. It's the only way that it happens. Who else? Who else? Who else are these thoughtful, committed, small that are changing the world? You. You. On May 26, on May 26, down the road at Hopewell Presbyterian Church, there were 13 Latino children on a stage. 13. Latino children on the stage, knowing their colors, knowing how to count, knowing the days of the week, knowing the months of the year, could follow every direction they were given in English. They were ready to graduate. I had never seen such fancy dresses since the last Disney Princess Festival. Little boys with ties this long, standing up, ready to go to kindergarten, ready to succeed. Valencia, Cesar, Shade, ready to go to CMS, kindergarten, and succeed. And Valencia's mother, who has learned English from her five-year-old daughter, stood up and said, thank you, thank you. This just makes all the difference in the world to my family. And Shade's grandfather, with the heaviest accent you can imagine, came up and said to me, On Thursday afternoons, Dave Whirling comes up from downstairs and says, Ben, tell Reverend Holler what you did. I made a five on the EOGs in math. Ben, tell Reverend Holler what you made last year. I made a one. On Wednesday nights, if I leave the office late, I'll encounter someone coming to our AA meetings. And on more than one occasion, I said, I have heard someone say to me, my life was a mess. It wasn't always a mess. It wasn't always a mess. I had a good job. I had good family. I had good relations. But I got derailed. And it's now not a mess. I'm working well. I'm reunited with my family. I'm a productive citizen. I have found myself again, and it is because I can come up this hill and go to these meetings. And there's some days I'm just hanging on by my nails, but if I can make it to this meeting, I know that I'll be okay. Do you understand? Every time you put a dollar in that plate, we pay for Valencia's teachers. Every time you put a quarter or five dollars in that plate, we keep the lights on for that man who is finding his way back to a whole life. Every time one of you says, I won't plant my garden flowers in my garden today, I won't go to my book club, instead I will go and be an aide down the road at Hopewell, we are changing the world. Never doubt what a small group of committed, thoughtful people can do. They change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that does. So brothers and sisters, what's next? Where do we go next? How do we change the world next? In your families? in your work, in the places you volunteer, how are you going to change the world next? Because all it takes is just that little mustard seed of faith. Because God won't call you into a place where you'll be overwhelmed and he won't ask you to do something he doesn't equip you to do. Where are you?
going next? <laughs>